The time has come. So the next keynote is from Mr. Nobuhiro Endo, the chairman of the board of NEC. Please, Mr. Endo. Good morning, everybody. I would like to express my gratitude for being invited to speak at CTEC as a keynote speaker. I'll be talking about value creation in cyberspace. After COVID-19, uh, many people have had to stay home and there has been a major impact on everybody. And likewise, a hundred years ago, there was the Spanish flu. But we are able to take advantage of ICT, which did not exist at that time. And so I believe that there will be a major evolution as a result of utilizing ICT. I'd like to talk about how we will be using ICT from now on and what we must be conscious about as we utilize ICT. Those are the points that I'd like to focus upon. When it comes to the ICT values, uh, there's the computing power, network, and software. These are the three elements. And by combining these three, uh, these are the three important functions. Uh, Real-time uh, response, next is dynamic response, and then the third is remote. What I mean by dynamic is that uh, data by itself does not have any particular value, but by gathering a massive amount of data and by doing processing such as AI processing, it's possible to create dynamically a completely different, deeper uh, sense of value. That's why I refer to this as being dynamic. And in the case of NEC, since 2013, as described at the very top, we have called upon orchestrating a brighter world. This is our company message. And we want to have close co communication and deep discussion with the market. And we wanted to identify issues that exist in greater detail so that we can create a brighter world. And by brighter, I mean two things, uh, bright in the sense of light and also uh, in, a, in the sense of being more smarter. And with that, we would like to achieve a brighter world with smarter solutions. And that was the intent behind the company message. In the background of this, there were the computing power, the network, and the software. And we wanted to combine them to be able to uh, respond uh, uh, real time, dynamically, and uh, in remote uh, situations so that we can achieve safety, security, fairness, and efficiency. And uh, we wanted to provide uh, new values through this. That was my intention at the time, and from that perspective, uh, we have to understand the issues of the new normal society, and we must look at uh, the uh, basic desires and using this of Mastro. Uh, we have been uh, pursuing this since uh, 20. 15, and this is the sense of direction that we have been pursuing. In regard to how much power ICT has, in 1995, according to my memory, there were the transition from analog to digital mobile phones. And around the year 2000, uh, the mobile subscribers exceeded the number of fixed line subscribers. So there was a major change. And since 1995 until uh, 2020, over the past 25 years, if we look at the computing power of the top computers and trace it, then we see that the power is 2.45 million times greater. And in the case of the mobile networks, the capacity has increased compared to 1995, has increased by 1 million times. and. Uh, when it comes to 2.45 million times greater computing power in 1995, uh, what I 
took a year over a task. Uh, so it's 24 hours a day times 365. Uh, but it's a matter of uh, 13 seconds that it's now possible to do that same task. And through that evolution, whereas a uh, task took one year in 1995, it now takes only 13 seconds. That's the kind of sensibility that we have as we try to generate new value. And when we look at the mobile networks, at that time it was uh, 9.6K, and now it's 10 gig communication, so I'm talking about 1 million times increase. And so it took 150 hours to read out a certain piece of information, but it is now possible to read out the same information in 0.5 seconds. So a massive amount of data can immediately be captured and immediately be processed. The capability is uh, available to humans. And by taking advantage of this, what kind of human society issues can be solved? And what kind of uh, human society values can be created? is the challenge that we are now faced with. When it comes to software, there was AlphaGo, and it came about in 2016 or 2017, and uh, this looked like AI was finally something that we could take advantage of. And I often bring out this chart. In 1980, there was the Othello uh, game. Uh, and the uh, human lost to a computer in Othello. And then uh, Shogi, uh, there was uh, 30 years later, a human lost to a computer. And uh, between Othello and Shogi, there's the difference of 10 to the 168 times. And at this time, I was the president of NEC, and so I thought that it would soon be the case where Go would find computers beating humans. But between uh, Shogi and Go, uh, the difference was 10 to the 134th. So I didn't exactly expect 30 years, but thought it would take 10 years before humans would lose to a human. But actually, it was only three years that a pro lost to uh, a computer. So truly, there are exponential changes that are taking place in terms of ICT strength and software strength. And we have seen this development taking place at the same time. And at NEC, when it comes to AI, we first got involved in postcards or a postal numbers and the reading out of uh, postal numbers. We developed software uh, 50 years ago. And then after that, fingerprints or facial recognition or voice recognition or a vein recognition from the palms were what we were involved with. And we were also involved with deep learning. As a result of that, uh, in the area of biometrics, we have high-value recognition technologies developed. And as a result, as you can see, there are about 100 persons here uh, descending the stairs. And in most cases, almost simultaneously, it's possible to do vo face recognition and to be able to identify who it is. This is because of the computing power and also because of the strength of the software involved. But on a real-time basis, it has become possible to do all of this. And how we can utilize this to create new value is the question that faces us. And as an extension of that, we have uh, the uh, uh, drug discovery through AI. And for COVID-19, uh, for a vaccine, uh, there is work uh, being taken using AI, and for fingerprints, uh, for infants from the age of one to five, by taking fingerprint measurements, it's possible to understand where vaccines could be effective in creating a society that eliminates diseases. And there is an uh, organization, Gavi, that delivers uh, vaccines, and NEC is uh, taking advantage of our biometric technology to help. And we've talked about one-year-old infants, but in NEC, we are looking at two hours after birth to be able to take the fingerprints of a small infant just two hours after birth so that 
we can trace uh, various types of records. And as an extension of the uh, network, we have the 5G technology, and it has become possible to take advantage of this. And the major point about 5G is that whereas uh, 4G mainly focused up until now on person-to-person -person communication, but with 5G, uh, since latency issues have been dramatically resolved, it will be machine-to-machine -machine or inter-robot uh, manipulation or the support of autonomous driving that can be carried out by networks. And I suspect that, or rather my expectation is that five years from now, uh, there will be a single support robot for every person that can be realized. And the 5G networks can in play a very important uh, role in supporting all of this, as well as uh, in the post-5G world, there is going to be a major support that can be realized. And with uh, KDDI and OYSG, we have been working on this. This is an unmanned uh, shovel vehicle. We have a program on this. And when disasters occur, uh, various types of heavy equipment is necessary to uh, restore the road functions and also to uh, eliminate the debris. It could be very dangerous conditions, and uh, it's necessary to try and do this on an unmanned basis. And so therefore, taking advantage of 5G communication technology on a real-time basis, it will be possible to manipulate. And a mechanism for this has been built. And by building up such a mechanism in lo remote locations, it will be possible to take advantage of this. Uh, that offers convenience, but also uh, it'll be possible for a single operator to be able to operate multiple locations simultaneously. So this should increase the convenience tremendously. Now, I've talked about very simple examples and talked about the possibilities. But now when we talk about a data society, as we try to achieve society 5.0 from society 4.0, uh, in society 4.0, we had an information society, whereas we're going to see a migration to a data society. But what's the difference between an information society and a data society? Well, in an information society, when we created value, uh, we looked at uh, similar data points, and as a basis, uh, we took a deductive approach in creating information, and based on that information, we created value. And in information society, that was the way value was created. But when it comes to a data society, uh, data becomes the source of value, and a massive amount of data that is collected and processed. Since we have that capability, a very wide range can be covered, and a wide different types of uh, data can be collected and processed immediately. And and it'll be possible to have an inductive uh, uh, creation of value. That's the difference. Another aspect that we have to be aware of is that uh, when it comes to an information society, there are many similar data points collected to uh, create information. And at that time, besides what is collected as data, the remainder are discarded. But it, in the information society, there are similar pieces of data that are collected and data was generated, but it tended to be partial optimization solutions. Meanwhile, in a data society, a massive amount of wide-ranging data sources can be immediately collected and processed, and so therefore a total optimization is possible to expect. And when we look at from a partial to a total optimization, this change reflects the changes taking place between information society and data society, and also in regard to how the overall optimization can be carried out is the question that faces our human society. And when it comes to the overall optimization, the most important thing is that we are looking at the very high KGIs, or key goal indicators, and for those indicators, uh, there are many people that are going to be involved, but it will be necessary to achieve consensus. And when it comes to achieving consensus among 
the values that were generated, we did not have this process in the past. So uh, for the first time in human society, it will be possible to create uh, value through consensus. And so therefore, we must be keenly aware of this. And if this consensus seems to be low, then only a low level of values can be generated. So it's necessary to look at how consensus can be achieved and in achieving overall uh, optimization. This is going to be an important process. And when it comes to the standpoint of data in human society, on a daily basis, uh, consecutively, uh, the data is collected. And in cyberspace, value is generated. And based on that, solutions are uh, provided to human society. And in that sense, uh, the data is a reliability and data is a quality are part of the uh, solution or answer to create a database a solution. This is uh, quite important. And on top of that, we take a data from uh, the physical uh, world and in a cyber space, it is possible to create a solutions, but those uh, solutions are to be brought back to the real uh, world. In the real world, what's necessary in the real world as a solution, and a solution created in the cyber space, there is a gap between the two. So in the real human society, if you want to mobilize the solutions, you have to have a physical interface properly. And if that physical interface is a proper or appropriate one, a good value can be cited in the human society. But what should be the interface format and so on? And based upon that, a cyber society, cyber space can create a value. And how can we build the architecture to provide efficient value? This architecture and interface for the future value creation in the cyberspace are very important. So uh, this is um, about a global standardization. And in the architecture domain, business model itself will be affected by the architecture design. So in that sense, in the cyberspace that was created, the architecture should be efficient and the impact is quite uh, big in terms of interface, so we need to have a good interface. And another point we have to keep in mind is that all the time a value chain has to be shaped and a value has to be delivered against such a backdrop. Considering a cyber security, it's quite easy to understand, but when you shape or create a value chain and if uh, there is a low level of cyber security, that would be the weaker point. And the value will be similar to that weak point. So for example, if you have to use a Japanese Hanko stamp, then a value chain as a whole will be at the level of the Hanko level. So that means you have to have a Hanko stamp all the time in that loop. So the important point here is that all parts have to have a good synchronization and have to level themselves up. That's necessary in our world, SMEs, have to be taken care of, and also the uh, government has to be taken care of as well. Local governments, I mean. And COVID-19 has uh, impacted our lives uh, to a great deal. But as I said earlier, uh, the Spanish uh, flu took place um, when we didn't have ICT capability. But now ICT can deliver so much uh, value for us. So going forward, it's uh, possible for us uh, to use ICT solutions and uh, remote and real time are important uh, components and these are two values are very impactful and in general in our case uh, we get together in one place in one location at the same time and deliver value that was something normal that uh, we had uh, that was the impression but in a distributed or uh, decentralized environment, it is possible to deliver a values. COVID-19 has revealed that. That's um, a very important uh, point. And remote and real time, why can they realize these things? That is uh, because it's a location free. And another point is that it's time free. As a result, a collective value creation to a distributed value creation, such a shift has taken place. So this uh, distribution or decentralization means uh, individuals' autonomy. So individuals' autonomy can be 
promoted more proactively, and by doing so, it is possible to create a bigger values. For example, when it comes to learning, individuals on an autonomous basis I can take remote options when it is available. So, for example, you want to be an engineer in the medical field, and if that's the case, you can study engineering. You want to learn that. At the same time, you want to learn a medicine too. So, an engineering department cannot give both to students. So, remote education from a medical department and education from an engineering department can be taken by individuals if they wish. And by doing so, a diverse curriculum can be created by the individuals themselves thinking about what sort of capability they want to develop. So value can be delivered in that way. So on a proactive basis, a remote education can be prepared. And the more preparation you make, you can just rely on individuals' autonomy. And individuals themselves can shape their own curriculum and without staying within one university they can create all sorts of values themselves. Likewise, uh, offices or businesses have to do the same. Now people are working from home because of remote solutions. And as an extension of that, within the same company, people of different departments can get together in a virtual uh, department. And in that virtual department, uh, they can uh, deliver value that may be possible, or you can have a one step back outside of the company from a different companies. Uh, capable people get together within a virtual uh, company. They may be able to start such a virtual company. So in that sense, a virtual and remote a possibility can be expanded going forward. The important point here is the autonomy of individuals that has to be unlocked. Solutions are necessary and the preparation is uh, needed. And so the, these are the viewpoints that I wanted to share with you. So in the cyber space, uh, we create uh, values. And what's important here is uh, how to provide a safe and a secure cyber uh, space. And the cyber space is the second borderless space uh, that humans uh, created. So in the outer space, at the very beginning, there was a small number of countries which did a development. So there was a space law, or space act. But internet has spread so rapidly, and so many countries started using the internet all of a sudden. So consolidating opinions and creating internet or cyber space law or act or legislation was not possible. If that's the case in the cyberspace, safety and security have to be protected by individual countries. Then the question is, uh, can each country do that? That's quite uh, difficult. So there has to be a group of uh, countries. So collective uh, defense kind of approach has to be taken. In the cyber space, protection has to be applied, and a safe and a secure cyber space has to be built, in my view. So in the cyber space, uh, collective uh, defense has to be applied and mutual trust is necessary. And mutual trust has to be built and nurtured. And all sorts of uh, communities have to do just that. So collective defense, what's most important for that is on a real time basis, each party can exchange important information in an environment that is uh, reliable. There has to be a confidence or trust. So building that is very important. So going forward, a collective defense image should be held in your mind firmly so that relevant companies can get together to create confidence that is necessary for collective defense. I think this is extremely important. As I said earlier, ICT value is very high. So in the safe and secure cyber space, if that can be created, that leads to a national power or state power. What I mean by this is that a, a highly capable human resources can be developed and businesses can deliver a high level of values outside of the country 
too. I think that is the, uh, what the state power means. So in the human uh, society, ICT can be well leveraged and we want to deliver a lot of uh, value. So this is the uh, needs hierarchy I talked about earlier, five uh, tier uh, needs hierarchy by Maslow and SDGs. There are 17 SDGs and if you look at them, there is a link between the Maslow uh, needs uh, hierarchy and the SDGs. You can allocate certain parts of the hierarchy to the SDGs. So you want to deliver values through ICT. At the very bottom, there is a physiological needs, and we cannot really make a direct contribution to that part. But if you see this upside down on the right-hand side, what I'm trying to say here is that ICT SDGs a contribution needs a platform or infrastructure. By creating infrastructure, logistics infrastructure can be more efficient. And by doing so, for example, a food energy can be efficiently delivered to people. I think that's what is enabled. Uh, such a contribution is a possible towards SDGs through ICT solutions. Now, businesses and the human society are uh, two sides of the same coin. Businesses have to have have to be able to sustain their activities. That's a very important factor for human society. A continuity is important. So businesses to ensure continuity has to deliver value to the human society. And if our value is recognized, appreciated by the human society, we can continue our business activities. So sustainability and continuity can work with each other. So uh, human society and businesses are really uh, two sides of the same coin. So from that viewpoint, uh, businesses themselves should have should create a long-term vision for humans. Uh, they can talk about that. That is my understanding. So under new normal, based upon uh, that, how can we create, uh, how can we uh, leverage ICT? I think that's what a uh, new normal is all about. I've uh, talked about all these uh, points, and at the very bottom, total optimization has to be considered to create a value, and individual autonomy has to be leveraged too. So we have to think about what sort of methodology is available. And at the very uh, bottom, we create all sorts of uh, values, which leads to evolution. We shouldn't prevent the evolution from unfolding and tolerance is very important here. Either way, we have to have a good evolution going forward, and that hinges on people's will or intention. So if everybody can have a good discussion, and within businesses, if they can have a long-term horizons, and then they think about what the way should be, and with a strong uh, motivation, we should uh, create a value. I think that's what uh, today's or future society requires. So by all means, we business people in various uh, communities uh, would like to engage in all sorts of uh, discussions. Well, thank you very much for your kind attention. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Endo.